Great. Thank you very much indeed, Ron. Thanks for the invitation, Ron and Michael, and um, it's really nice to be here. Um, so I guess my role is to kind of put a context on where we are present in the pre op treatment rectal cancer, and more so than that, I'd like to talk a little bit about where we're going and where some of the exciting international trials are at at present. This is a picture I really like because this is the way we used to treat rectal cancer, happily not anymore. We used to do a post-op. We do it with what we used to call two-dimensional radiotherapy, big, big open fields. We treated, it was based on bony landmarks. We treated loads and loads of small bowel, which was often fixed post-op. Whoops. We treated lots of bladder, usually the entire bladder. It wasn't very nice treatment. It didn't work as well as modern treatment, but I'll mention that a little later on. So I don't really want to troll over trials that you all know about, but in terms of context, I have to mention some uh, uh, older trials. So we've lots of data which um, gives us the, the, the reasons to give chemo radiotherapy. So this is new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. Here's the major trials. I certainly won't go through all of them. That's the German trial there. It's a very, very important study. And this moved the whole world to pre-op. This was a, a study of about 800 patients, uh, pre-op chemo rads and surgery, or post-op, or, or, or surgery and post-op chemo rads. And unusually, it was a positive double whammy. So what was really good about this was that, I can't get used to this at all. There isn't a laser pointer by any chance, is there? Anyway, what was really good about this trial is that the pre-op arm halved local recurrences from 6 to 13%. Survival was the same. But what was great, as well as the pre-op arm being more efficacious, there was less toxicity. And it's quite rare in an oncology trial for something to work better but have less side effects. Lovely, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks. So pre-op chemo rads became the standard really after this study was, was published. We then had to figure out who to give it to, of course, because prior to that, the pathology report said who needed more treatment, and then we defined a a way of predicting who needed treatment on an MR. And I'll mention more of that in a second. Short course radiotherapy is not popular in Ireland. Uh, and it's a little hard perhaps to understand why. I think we're a little biased against it. A lot of our, our surgeons are, 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 um, are, are trained in the North America. Maybe that's a reason. Radiation oncologists are a little biased against it because it's a very large fraction of treatment every day for five days. And we find that a little weird. And we find it weird in terms of toxicity, but the trials say that we shouldn't be biased against it. And I hope I can show you that. So these, these are the, the main short course studies. Really important thing about these, the numbers really are huge. A lot of trials are quoted around rectal cancer that are institutional data and a variety of other things. These are big, big, big level one standard international randomized trials. So that's one arm. So the Dutch study there, for example, is almost a thousand patients. So these were all surgery on its own, or short course radiotherapy with surgery the following week. Five grade per day for five days and surgery the following week. Big difference here is the Swedish study, which kicked it all off. It's the smallest of the three, but this was a non-TME study, and these are TME studies. And you can see that there was a big advantage in terms of local control by giving short course. There was no benefit in terms of survival uh, um, by giving a short course. However, this is I think a very important slide, when the Dutch study, the largest of these almost 200 patients was updated, long-term follow-up, you can see that overall local recurrence was very, very significantly improved by short course radiotherapy. Here's the years of follow-up, that's 12 and a half years. Here's local recurrence, so big advantage. Survival is exactly the same. But in the forest plot, if you break down the results, Here's stage one, two, and three. In stage three, you can see that see, the confidence intervals don't cross zero there. So that is a survival benefit for stage three patients that are given short course as opposed to radiotherapy alone. And that's, an, that's about a 10% absolute difference. It's a very important uh, finding, I think. Now, short course versus long course, we now have two studies. This is the TROG study. This is the Trantasman group. Quite a simple study just over 300 patients. It, it's not an equivalent study. It keeps being called that, but it isn't it. You could never have an equivalent study with, with that size. So it's short course radiotherapy and surgery, 
versus chemo rads and surgery. Straight comparison, one-to-one -one randomization. And what this showed, obviously, the response and downstaging are superior in the chemo rads arm. They'd have to be, because you wait six weeks for you operate in chemo rads, but in short course, you operate the following week. But sphincter preservation and local occurrence are exactly the same. I'll come back to that. And disease-free survival and overall survival are exactly the same. And toxicity of bowel is exactly the same. And surgical complications are exactly the same. So any of the biases we had appear not to really be founded. That's all complications post-op, perineal wound complications, and asthmatic breakdown. So this is a very recent trial in saying that short course looks just as good as long course for most situations. Prior to that, Bushko's group in Poland did a very, very similar trial. They powered it differently. This was powered against sphincter preservation. But it was about 300 plus patients. Again, very, very similar. Short course in surgery versus long course chemo rads in surgery. And very, very, very similar results. Increased PCR as we'd expect. Sphincter pres, local recurrence the same. And overall survival and disease survival the same. So people keep saying these are equivalent. You can't say that. It's not an equivalent trial. It's superiority trials. But they look awful equivalent in two trials on different sides of the world. So our bias against short course looks a little unfounded based on that data. What is clear is that for big ugly tumors like this, this is a 3B tumor. That's a lot of extramural extension there. And this is on the CRM. It's on the circumferential section margin on MR. These are not suitable for a short course approach. These need downsizing and downstaging. So you give chemo rise in that situation. And the other thing that was apparent in the short course trials, in the TROG trial in particular, is for low tumors, you give chemo rads. You don't give short course. Um, in the TROG study, there was no recurrences of low tumors if they had chemo rads. There was 12% local recurrences if they had short course. That wasn't significant, but that's because of the numbers involved. So these patients need downstaging. These are nice uh, uh, schematics from a recent study from MSK. That's a low rectal cancer on a schematic. That's the plane of abdominal per perineal excision or resection. You can see that you get right in close there. That's the waist on the TME specimen where it cones in. The problem is that where it cones in is where the tumor is. We've known for a long time since it was first described in Leeds that there could be positive margins in a lot of these patients. This is a nice picture of a schematic and a specimen from an extra levator uh, resection where you go wide and you stay way, way uh, wide in the plane of the section. And you can see that waste doesn't exist there. But irrespective of the type of surgery for low tumors, you need chemo rads. <coughs> now, non-op you could talk about all day. It's relevant to the trials I'm gonna talk about later, so I'll mention it very briefly. Habergamma, you all know about. This was my attempt 10 years ago to explain Habergamma. She started with low rectal cancers, gave them chemo rads. If you had a positive biopsy, you got surgery. If by endoscopic means, not by MR and so on, you had no tumor, you were observed. And it started with um, 265 and 71 observations. That's a lot of observations for that number of patients, but that's what it was. That moved to 361, that number moved to 111, and it's increased since then. And these results at five years are very impressive. However, a lot of patients recur in the first year. So if you're gonna do this, you do it in a trial and you do it very, very carefully, because if you don't get these quickly, you may affect their salvage, surgery salvage success. And there's lots more results in Habergam. She's published a lot. Uh, some people are fans, some aren't. I I'm very wary of this uh, personally. Um, this is a paper I'd recommend <clears throat> for those interested. Rob Lynn Jones wrote this, where he looked at a, a very, very good critique of Habergamma's work. And he said that complete clinical response definition was inconsistent. And we'll see where it's not in the current trials. And he's, he's concerned that those that fail to sustain complete clinical response may fare worse than those that undergo immediate resection, and there is a suggestion of that. My big concern is this, that people translate this data into all rectal cancers. This was for distal rectal cancers, and they're much easier to watch than other rectal cancers. 
Um, and also, you've got to follow these up very intensively, far more intensively than she did, I believe. And in busy clinics, that can, that can fall away. So we'll see in a minute how that's done really well. But there's loads of data to say it's really hard to assess complete responders after chemo rads. Tons of data to say it. Here's one nice series where they did preoperative biopsies on patients after chemo radiotherapy. So we did six weeks. And in, the in, where is it now? 11 of 16 cases that had residual cancerous biopsies were negative. So you really, really, really can't rely on biopsies. Now maybe if you do lots of them, you can, but you really can't. Here maybe is why a really nice study from MSK from 2013. So this is people who are given chemo rads who have residual disease. And this says YP, uh, T1, 2, 3, and 4. So what their stage was when they had their operation. Y means they had preoperative treatment. P means pathological stage. Disease in mucosa is red, submucosa blue, muscularis subserosa. So say, say people that had teeth residual disease, about half them didn't have any disease in the submucosa or mucosa. So how are you going to get a positive biopsy? And yet they had disease in the muscularis. And the same goes through for the T2s. So you can see why the biopsies are negative in such patients, even in the presence of residual disease. So really nice data to show how concerning uh, that is. Here's another nice paper again from MSK. They took uh, clinical complete responders that had surgery. So the surgeon looked carefully and said the disease is all gone, insofar as you can tell. And three quarters of those had residual disease on pathology. Now you can argue that that may have sterilized if it was left longer, and that may be true, but you can see the nature of the problem. With imaging, we have similar problems. Here's an old slide of mine. This is a low rectal cancer outlined. This is really low now. Here's the levator. This is issue rectal fossa. It's only a little wedge of mesorectum. And you can see this is breaching the CRM. So the, the surgical plane that we can draw on MRI, this is going through it. He's a standard operation. He's a positive margin. So we got pre-op chemo rads, and you can see, and we'll come back to this again, here's a very typical appearance when you do an MRI four weeks after. You get big, big debulking and a big change in signal. This intermediate signal goes down to a black scar on MRI four weeks after, on T2MR. And that's the slide that correlates to that. That crescent of scar there is that. We can't tell in an MRI what this scar is. We've no idea, really. And the radiologists can't tell, and radiologists have proven they can't tell. But this guy, in fact, had a complete response. Those little tendrils of dark signal are those, and this is all scar. So he had surgery that didn't benefit him, but we wouldn't have known that looking at that. Similar again, different patient, low, low rectal cancer on coronal. This is the sphincter complex, that's the tumor, there's the levators. Four weeks post chemo rads, you're just left with a black scar. Who knows what that is? And in fact, it's been shown very well by Regina Beats Town in Maastricht that radiologists are as good at predicting what that means as a toss of a coin, looking at MR. They'd be right 50% of the time. Um, it's been published recently that the size and volume change post chemo rads is as good as anything in predicting response. We can also use other modalities of MR. <coughs> if you add in diffusion weighted imaging, you get much better results in, completing, in predicting complete response. The, the, the series looking at all of these imaging things tend to be small series, and, and we need a big randomized trial to, with an MRI component of it to give us better information, I think. Um, this was a really nice paper from Korea, which combined both MRI and PET to try and predict response. I was very interested in this approach for my own study, but logistically it kind of can't be done, I think. But this is a bulky tumor on T2MR before any treatment. That's a high B value DWI, diffusion weighted imaging image. You can see this is all bright signal here uh, in keeping with the tumor. That's a PET. There's the bladder, there's the tumor. Gave chemo rads, again, big, big debulking, just a black scar. All this white signal has reduced in keeping with the response. 
and all this avidity has, has reduced. And the idea is that if you combine the drop in avidity, which is a SUV drop, it's a numerical drop, and drop in ADC, it's another a, a number you can get from DWI that you can, can predict complete response better, but this is on a small number of patients and hasn't been validated. Dynamic contrast enhanced MR looks a little more promising. In fact, is there a radiologist here by any chance? So I can really spout like I know what I'm talking about then. Okay, good. So uh, I know nothing about this, um, but it looks promising from what data we have. This is a small series. Here's um, uh, the difference in, 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 in dynamic contrast enhanced signal pre-chemo rads and post-chemo rads. And the value you get, it corresponds to SUV or to ADC, is called the K-trans. And they show the difference in that corresponds to the T downstaging. So that, that's very early data, but looks, um, isn't done very much in Ireland, but could be, uh, and looks promising. But none of these things are very well proven, and we need a lot more data. Now, this is Trek. I think this is a really interesting study. This is completed. This is from a guy called Simon back in Birmingham. So these patients wouldn't normally get radiotherapy. This is early patients, T1, T2s, randomized to standard surgery or to short course radiotherapy and transanal excision via TEMS. And if you got a TEMS and ha had high risk features, you went and got surgery. Now I haven't, I'm not sure that the results have been published yet, but this trial led on to Star Trek which we are taking part in in Ireland. Des Winter and John Armstrong are joining us from Vincent's. So we approved this recently at ICORG. This is a really interesting study, and this is real progress in terms of the non-operative field. So sorry for the intensely busy slide. So please note that these are early cancers, a bit like Trek, only a little more locally advanced. CT1 to 3AB, so a lot of these wouldn't get any pre-op treatment. And the randomized two to one, the standard arm is just straight to surgery. So same as the standard arm of Trek. The two to one, the two then is the organ preservation arm. This is really appealing, I think. So these either get short course or chemo rads, and then they have a stratified management. If they has a complete if they have a complete response, they get watched, no more treatment. If they have an incomplete response, they get a TEMS, and if no response, they get standard surgery. So that's really appealing. We don't know it, how well it's gonna work, but this is really carefully put together, and I think this is a really nice study from a very good set of people in the UK. One really important thing is they very carefully looked at what constitutes complete response and what the follow-up is, and that is really critical in a non-op or potentially non-op setting. So it's pretty obvious in many ways, but it's still set in stone. So MR is negative, no nodes in MR, nothing on DRE, nothing in sigmoidoscopy. Partial response is a little bit in MR, no nodes, good at DRE response, good sigmoidoscopy response. And then as you might imagine, no response means disease on MR, not much on DRE sigmoidoscopy in terms of response. And they get stratified then and they get a very set, <coughs> careful follow-up. That the problem with these patients is they might not relapse intraluminally. Most probably do, but they may relapse nodally or, else, or, or elsewhere in the mesorectum, in fact. We don't really know. There's a suggestion from Maastricht that about five to 10% may relapse nodally if you start with locally advanced. So you need the MR. I would have done it more than three years, but trials are practicality. So that's a big, big, uh, uh, advance, I think. That's going to be really interesting. That's going to be hard to recruit to in Ireland, I think, actually. I think it's a big sell, but I think it's a really good study, and I'm really glad someone's taken it in Ireland has taken part in it. So, across the water in America, there's also a very different slant, but an equally uh, important advance in terms of non operative management. So, this is looking at a, a, an increasingly popular paradigm. I'll show you later on why. This comes from um, MSK, and there's a non-operative management as part of this, but they've taken the opportunity to look at different sequences here. So these are more locally advanced than Star Trek. These are locally advanced stage twos and threes, and they get randomly assigned to uh, Falfox or Kfox up front, so induction chemo, and then chemo rads, 
or chemo rads and then the chemo. Okay, so they're, they're sequencing differently. There's a lot of interest in this, uh, uh, I'll show you, and there's a lot of interest in doing it this way, which I, I kind of support, but there's some nice trials I'll mention in a minute. And then you get reassessed, and not surprisingly, if you have a complete response, non-operative management, if you haven't, if you've got disease left, you get surgery. And what they've done also is they very carefully set out what each means. Uh, and I think this is fantastic. You'll remember that Rob Glenn Jones criticized Habergama in not being consistent what response was. And it's just critical because this is, you'll miss the chance of cure. So here's their example of a clinical complete response. There's no disease left in endoscopy, post chemo rads, bulky tumor. And again, a bit like my examples earlier, all you're left with is a very deep bulk tumor and a low intensity scar. That's a complete response. Would be suitable for non-operative management. Big difference here is that in Star, in Star Trek, here you'd get a TEMS, in this you get a TME. So there's a disease left behind there here, post chemo rads, and there's some bulk left behind there. So that patient gets surgery. And here's an obvious one. This is an incomplete response. Loads of tumor left on sigmoidoscopy and bulk of disease left on MR. So straight to surgery. So that's gonna be really, really interesting. And I think it's a real, sign of progress, that non has been out there now for more than a decade, but now it's been moved forward in a very careful and scientific way, and they're really good trials. Um, now, concomitant chemo is mostly a very negative story. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about it in two slides. Uh, Professor Mayat may be disgusted because he's involved in Aristotle, isn't that correct? Yeah. You're an investigator? Yeah. Uh, so my apologies not spending more time. Um, so, you all know the CAPE or 5FU our gold standards with radiotherapy pre-op. And we've looked for a long time for something better, and so far no one's found anything better, although we're still looking. The most obvious thing seemed to be to move oxaloplatin into the concomitant phase with radiotherapy, and big studies did it. I'm deliberately not showing you results from all of these because it's too much data. But these studies are all big randomized studies, and they were very worth doing. That shows some important stuff about Cape Cytomine, I think. But these all showed no benefit, and indeed more toxicity. But the German study from Klaus Rodell did show a higher response rate, no increased toxicity, and a slightly better disease-free survival. So, but overall, that was out of keeping with these, and oxaloplatin with 5FU is not a standard of care in most places in the world, although done a little bit in their group. This is, um, uh, a, a recruiting trial in the UK that Professor Mayant is, is an investigator on called Aristotle. I know your colleague, David C. Montefiore, likes Greek philosophers. This is called Aristotle, and there's a series of new anal cancer trials which are called the Plato trials. Why not? Uh, I called my trial Trilark, which is a lot less imagination than Aristotle and Plato, but there you go. So this is a selective trial uh, of locally advanced tumors uh, 900 plus, and they get chemo rads or chemo rads with a rhinotecan weekly. So similar approach to the ones I just showed you, but instead with the rhinotecan, this is doing well. I think it had two thirds recruited last year. Is that correct? Yeah. So like all these trials in the UK, the recruitment is simply awesome. The, the, I, I'm always in awe of how well UK GI trials recruit. Best example is ACT2. That was simply extraordinary. There's more now, but 10 years ago or so, there was about 750 anal cancers in the UK in a year. And in seven years, I think it was, they got a thousand patients into a trial. And that's simply stunning. I don't think any other country in the world can do that. Um, uh, and we should work a lot more with the UK than we do. The new anal cancer trial, I'm gonna be on the pilot phase of Act 5, which is wonderful. I don't think anyone's ever been on the pilot phase of a UK study before, so I'm delighted to be, get the opportunity of doing that. And that's a great study. I won't talk about that anymore today, but it's a, it's a real pleasure to do so. So induction chemo is big news right now, really big news, uh, because it's gonna become a standard of care, I think. I think this is with the way things are going. A lot of studies now, and I'll show you why. So expert was going on when I was in, in, in the Marsden, this is David Cunningham's study, about 100 patients, and this established a, a, a kind of a, 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 a proof of principle of induction chemotherapy. So 
This here is Cape Cytobine, this here is oxaloplatin. So you got induction Cape Ox. Now do remember these are very locally advanced cancers by MR criteria, not by the usual stage three and four criteria. So they got Cape Ox by four, they got Cape Rads, surgery, and some more Cape. And they did well with a path complete response rate of 20%. And one important thing is that the tumor doesn't get worse when you give induction chemo, it gets better. That's an important point, especially for oligometastatic disease. One possible weakness of that for me is I think maybe this should be short course, but we'll come to that. Then they built on expert C. So this is pretty much expert, except the adjuvant chemo is intensified. That's the same as that, except the green arrows is cetuximab. And what was interesting was when this trial completed, it was a little bit bigger than expert. The primary outcome measure was complete response. And that was similar, although a lot less than expert, which I think is interesting, but temporary complete response rate. And cetuximab made a difference to those patients that we kind of know to make a difference. Those are suitable for cetuximab. So that was a neat trial, but that was the first time I came across induction <coughs> chemo. It hasn't really caught on in general in other countries, but it's doing so, and this is the reason why, in particular in the US. This is a small study. That's a source of a lot of criticism. This is a smaller study from Degas Rag, who's now in Dina Farber, then an MSK. Small number of patients got induction chemo. These are not locally advanced like the previous tumors, but are stage two and three. And if you didn't respond, you got chemo rads. If you did respond, you didn't get chemo rads. So this is excluding chemo rads, surgery and chemo. And people who did respond and didn't get chemo rads seem to do well. They all had R0 sections, they all had regression. I thought to say rads don't have a role in my view, but they did well. Now, despite the number there, and that's a source of criticism, you can have your own views on that, that has led to PROSPECT, which is a very major, large, randomized trial in the US, now recruiting. So it's a, it looks a bit involved, but it's not really. It's pretty much like the previous slide. These are non-locally advanced tumors, but su suitable for pre-op. Go to this arm first. This is chemo rads with five of you are CAPE and surgery. This here, one-to-one -one randomization. Here you got FALFOX first. If you had regression of 20%, I'm uh, oh, sorry, if you had no regression, then you had chemo rads. I got it wrong, sorry, apologies. If you had not enough regression, you got chemo rads. If you had more than 20 minute response via ultrasound, you went straight to surgery. That's what it is. And then you had adjuvant chemotherapy. So those that respond, 20% is, is pragmatic rather than proven, but those that respond omit chemo rads and go straight to surgery. So that, that's, that's an attractive paradigm, maybe not for me, uh, but um, it, it may work well. Who they included in the trial is, is really interesting. Not low tumors, not M2, not CRM positive. So none of these would have been eligible for expert C. So these are the kind of uh, tumors that often don't get pre-op treatment at all in some centers in the UK, and are considered by some to be borderline. I have a view on that, but many consider them to be borderline. But those are the ones that are going to be in this, not the really one, not, not the ones that we consider <clears throat> utterly critical to get pre-op treatment. So this is doing well. It already had that a year ago. So Rapido is a bit similar. They make a nice point here, which is that if you have a very locally advanced rectal cancer that is a big systemic risk, you haven't got time to give chemo rads in many ways. Because by the time you get to chemo, you'll have taken up about four months between giving the chemo rads, the interval of surgery, recovering after surgery. And that means your body doesn't get treated for four months. People all used to give this to people with resectable liver disease, which is, is wrong, because you're not treating their liver, you're not treating what will kill them. So you can't give that straight. You either give induction chemo in, in, in liver disease that's resectable, give induction chemo in that, or reduction chemo and, and short course. But they built a trial on this. It's randomized to chemo rads and surgery, then chemo, standard, or short course, then chemo, then surgery. And I think this is a very, very attractive paradigm, actually. So you get your radiotherapy in first, 
extended interval to surgery, <coughs> and in that time, then you give a good systemic treatment. So you treat them systemically early. I think that's, that may work quite well, actually, and that's recruiting at present in Scandinavia. Very locally advanced tumors, these are not early ones. This is just reported. Uh, I haven't even seen the paper yet. It's EPUB right now. This is the latest trial from Bushko's group. 500 patients, locally advanced, quite locally advanced, randomized to short course and chemo, so a, a rapido type protocol, versus a concomitant oxaloplatin type protocol, so what Rodella was doing. And the results in that are really interesting. I haven't got any graphs because the paper, I haven't seen the paper yet. PCR was the same, disease free survival was exactly the same, but it's about almost a 10% difference in overall survival. So that may be a quirk, because that's the same, sorry, uh, that's the same, but that isn't. But we need more uh, follow up and need to see more details to know how to interpret that. But that, that could be onto something, I think. That's interesting. And also, the short course arm was less toxic. So, this is the, the last the new studies I'm going to show you. This is really interesting as well, and it's very much on the same page as those previous studies. This is again uh, uh, fresh off the presses from MSK in New York. This is a non randomized set of trials, uh, about 250 patients overall. Everyone had chemo RADs in a pretty standard way. But in group one, you had chemo RADs and surgery. Group two, you had chemo RADs, then two cycles of chemo, then surgery. Three, uh, uh, chemo rads, three cycles of chemo, then surgery. Four, chemo rads, four cycles of chemo, then surgery. And look what happened, pathological response. It went from 20% to 40%. And if you believe that PATCR is all about patients' long-term outcome, that's very, very attractive. Now, it got a little more toxic as you gave more chemo. That stands to reason. But most of that was uh, uh, a low newts and surgical complications are the same across all arms. That's now moved to a randomized trial. And again, all of these new trials are all looking at chemotherapy given before surgery in some, uh, in some way, in some sequencing. So it's all heading the same way for me. Um, the, the, the weakness of this, I think, is that should be short course, actually. I don't think chemo rads is necessary in that situation. So lastly, how do we give radiotherapy? Via 2D? No. This is called 3D radiotherapy, where everyone has a CT. You draw what you want treated, which is the pink line, and then you get lots of nice, colorful lines from a radiation oncologist. This is, are all percentages of dose, but like a weather chart. We want the green, which is 95% of the dose, to surround our target. It does so pretty well, actually. But there are lots of situations where it's not really, doesn't really look to be enough. The, the white there is high-dose radiotherapy. This is where it's given 3D. But the problem is, we don't need to treat that middle bit. That's bladder and small bowel. There's no occurrences there. So when you give 3D, the radiotherapy can't turn a corner. The radiotherapy has to go straight. So you get needlessly treated small bowel and bladder. But with IMRT, which is a new technology that I won't try and explain, you can shape the radiotherapy very nicely, actually. And the more advanced the IMRT, the better you can do this. And we've, we've proven that. And you can keep the radiotherapy where you want it, and you can spare some bladder and spare some bowel. And this was shown on a planning computer some years ago in the Marsden. And we've shown that also on a planning computer. Uh, clinically, it's never been looked at in a randomized fashion. This is from the east coast of the States. The black is people that are given 3D, the gray is people that are given IMRT, <coughs> and you can see that there's more toxicity, there's grade two and grade three toxicity. If you give slightly older fashion radiotherapy, there's more toxicity there and more toxicity there. So in retrospective series, it looks like IMRT is worth giving. This is my trial, Trilark. So this is where we take standard patients suitable for a pre-op approach. They all have the same surgery, they all have the same chemotherapy, but they're given either 3D or IMRT. That's recruiting at present and is doing well. We've received a lot of support from the Matter Hospital and we're uh, just starting to recruit Matter patients now, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful for this. 
We have a very exciting translational component to this study, and we take a lot of samples. The patients are very good to us. We're looking at circulating tumor DNA. We're looking at circulating tumor cells. CTCs have a very known role in prognostication in breast cancer. There's not a lot known about them in rectal cancer. We hope to <coughs> contribute to that, that knowledge. And then some other stuff we found that we looked at mutations in locally advanced rectal cancer, and we found that the PI3AK mutation predicts for chemoradiotherapy resistance. That was a significant result in 200 odd patients taken by Vincent's and Beaumont. And we're looking at this and a whole bunch more. We're doing a whole, a whole exome sequencing on these patients. One last thing I'll tell you about this trial before I finish is that we, in breast cancer, there's a really nice test you can do where you give induction chemo you take a, a sample, a biopsy, three weeks into it, you do what's called an RNA disruption assay, and that's validated to prove prediction of response to chemo. Hasn't been tried in other tumors, but my colleague Brian Hennessy was approached to see would this apply to rectal cancers. So we wondered, could we get tissue from patients three weeks into chemo RADS? We started doing this recently in Beaumont, and almost all patients allow us to do so. The biopsies are straightforward, and we're doing this at present. So we'll see, does this work as a tumor, as, a, as a, a predictor of response in rectal cancer in the same way as it does in, um, in breast cancer. So that's a quick sketch of where we are at present and more importantly, where we're going. I think things are gonna change based on those trials and it's, it's an exciting time. Thank you very much. <laughs>